My name is Scott Davis, and I'll be presenting on a research project that I've been doing with Dr. Long and Dr. Park for about the past year. Um, so we've been researching water transport in trees for the potential to actually have almost zero energy cost water transport. Um, so we've been looking at sequoias, the tallest trees in the world. Uh, I don't know if you're very familiar with them, but they can reach heights of over 100 meters. So standing here, you would probably be like down at the bottom of the picture. The tree is huge, like football field. Um, so I'm going to, just a quick overview of what I'm going to cover. So the research background that I'm going to give is just a quick refresher on the fluids and then you'll probably maybe a little familiar with actual water transport in trees. So we'll cover both of those and then our goals and motivation. Uh, we want to break the theoretical limit to the height of a water column, which is about 34 feet. Um, I'm going to talk about the best theory that explains water transport in trees and then the research methods that we're using to approach how to apply that in the real world. Uh, so current transport theories, the first one, you can see the picture here, uh, capillary pressure. So depending on the tube and the fluid that you're actually working with, if you put a tube into a fluid, the water's either going to rise or fall. So if you have a hydrophilic surface, the water is going to be pulled up that surface. So if we assume it's perfectly hydrophilic, um, from surface tension, the water has a theoretical height limit. Um, in a tree, that only drives the flow, depending on the tree, three to five meters. That's nowhere near the sometimes 100 meters that a sequoia actually reaches. So that doesn't cover the full amount of water transport. The next one is chemical retention. You can't really see very clearly, but depending on the solute concentration in the cell and outside of the cell, the water will be driven by that chemical potential. In a tree, that's about three meters. So now we're at the most eight meters of the tree of a hundred meter tall tree. So the next one, when you ask people the question, how does water get to the top of a tree? They'll say, well, maybe the roots are pumping the water. The issue with that is the tree's cells that are actually transporting water are dead. So they don't actually do anything. It's just the structure and energy from the environment that helps drive that flow. So the cells themselves are not spending any energy. Um, there's a very, very small energy cost that we'll get into later, but it's minimal compared to the actual water flow. Um, and in the trees that we're studying, on the west coast there's a lot of fog in certain parts of the year, so that can account for up to 30% of the water transport, but the issue with that is that doesn't help the tree make it through the year. So there's got to be something else allowing the water to be drawn to the top of the tree. And then we're, later on we're going to talk about the best theory that's out there and then some of the potential issues, some of the things that you don't understand about that theory. Um, so these are the cells, or this is the structure that the water is actually transported through. It's the dead part of the tree. Uh, the living part is the band between the xylem and the flow. So just a quick fluids review, we know that water transport is driven by a pressure differential. Um, so at the bottom, if, the best way to think about it is a manometer. Um, so at the bottom you have atmospheric pressure, and at the top, the lowest pressure we know that you can actually reach is zero. So you're limited to atmospheric pressure to drive the flow, unless you change the pressure at the bottom. So atmospheric pressure is about 14.7 PSI, that's 2.31 feet of water is what it corresponds to. So we can push water up to 34 feet, but then at the top, you're stuck at zero pressure, which we think is the lowest you can go. Um, so if you try to draw water up a tube, once you reach zero pressure at the top, that's it. You have no more potential. So either you go beyond what we know as conventional water transport, or you manipulate the pressure at the bottom. Um, so why does this 34-foot limit matter? In the real world, to actually drive water up a certain height, we use a pump. So we're spending a lot of energy to get that water up. The tree spends almost no energy. Uh, we can look at it as pretty much zero energy cost. All it is is controlling that water flow. So it's a very minimal amount. The cells in the trees that control it barely spend any energy. The applications. So if we figure out how this works, to figure out how to draw a water column up, more than 34 feet, uh, we can pass, have passive wells, so you don't have to spend any energy to get water out of a well. And the application we're looking at is geothermal heating. So we can take 
energy that's down below the earth and heat a structure with very little energy. All we have to do is control our system. Um, so how do we address that 34 foot limit? If we think about traditional water flow, um, the water is almost in compression, if you will. That pressure differential, you're pushing the water up, so the pressure in the water is towards the center of the molecule. So all the pressure is coming in. Um, that's traditional hydrostatic pressure. If we can sustain tension in water, then we can go above that 34 foot limit. The only issue with that is once you have tension in water, we know real world that there's a bubble in that water. Pulling on it is going to cause that bubble to grow, it's going to cavitate, and the water column is going to break. Uh, so if we can sustain tension in water, then we can actually break that 34 foot limit. The trade-off with our application, uh, we're going to end up with really low flow rates. So a tree, it's 500 gallons a day. Uh, that's, if you go, I'm not going to go back to the picture. Um, some of those trees, the ones where you actually get 500 gallons a day, you're talking 15 meters of girth on the tree. Uh, so the way that we're doing this, or the way that we're approaching the problem, is we're trying to mimic the cell structure, because like I said, those cells are dead. So if we can copy that structure and figure out the way the system behaves, then we can mimic it in the real world. And when we started the project, we looked at a couple of different options for doing that. But the issue was, to understand the system, we needed to be able to see it. Uh, so we got rid of the potential for micro milling. The size of the cells is very small. We could have milled it in metal, but we couldn't actually watch what was going on. So we chose photolithography. Um, and I'm running out of time, but I, we're basically using the same process that they use to make micro, uh, microchips for computers. So it's a polymer base, and you're etching that polymer. You can get a really precise cell structure. Um, that helped us mimic almost exactly or a, a close approximation of what's in the tree. Um, the issue with that, once we hit a certain point, we can't scale that up. So we're looking for alternatives now to, now that we understand the system, we're going to take it and expand it into a more manufacturable real world option. Any questions? I'll probably cover a little more next week. It's a lot of research. Um, I have another six minute talk. So I'll cover a little more of what we've actually done. It's a pretty broad topic and I didn't think about how much time I had. So if you all have questions, we can cover it next week too.